On today's show, my friend Glenn Wolf of ATL on 29 is back to continue our player capsule series with a look at Sadiq Bey and some reactions to the NBA draft because, of course, the Hawks make number one overall in this year's draft. We'll get into part one of two right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1719 of Lock on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Sunday into Monday. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at Prize Picks, the easiest most exciting way to put daily fantasy sports. The place to go is prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. And use code locked on NBA when you get there for a first time deposit match up to $100. Check it out now at Prize Picks. Also, want to encourage you at the top of the podcast, as I always do, to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out and subscribe to Locked on Hawks anywhere you might find your podcast. That includes Apple and Spotify and Overcast on the audio side, as well as YouTube on the video side. And I'm joined today for a two-part discussion by my friend Glenn Willis of ATL on 29. Glenn is plugged in all the time on the Atlanta Hawks. And we were, we've were we been doing this player capsule series for a couple of years now. This is the uh, several installments for this year as well. And in today's podcast, we'll focus heavily on Sadiq Bey. But before we get to the Sadiq, we'll also talk about a little bit of the NBA draft fallout and the lottery and all the reactions there and all of what Glenn thought about the Hawks winning the lottery and what happens now for Atlanta. So all that said, part two should be available in your podcast feed of choice right now after part one is completed. So go ahead and click on over to that for part two of this discussion. Please check out Glenn's work at ATL on 29 as well. Subscribe to this podcast. And without any further delay, here we go with part one with myself and Glenn. I am joined once again by my friend Glenn Willis. Glenn, how are you on this fine weekend? Yeah, good. Uh, been lots to talk about since the ping pong balls uh, you know, <laughs> fell the Hawks way a week, a week ago. But I know we're going to steer back to our traditional kind of player capsules, but uh, we'll have to be compelling uh, to uh, hold people's interest because all everybody wants to talk about now is that pick. Yeah, I'm trying to at least pace myself a little bit here. I think people haven't quite realized how long it is from the lottery to the draft. And if all you do is talk about Alex Sar for six weeks, I think people will be excited about that. But on some level, there's only so much you can say about any single prospect. And we're still going to do plenty of draft content, but uh, people do enjoy these player capsules. Uh, since you're here, you mentioned it. Like we haven't talked in this form, you and I, since the lottery happened. I wonder, kind of, what your takeaways are, broadly speaking, because you know I talked about this a lot with Tyler on the last episode um, of this podcast. But it's like it makes an already pretty impactful summer even much more on the spotlight. It feels like there's even more attention and more more pivot points and really more impact on the whole is kind of where I am. The most interesting aspect of them winning the lottery is, yeah, you know, when you look at the trade they made with San Antonio, the status of their draft picks. You know, a week before a week ago, I would sit and think, what is the real next opportunity to fundamentally change the roster, fundamentally improve the roster? What is that opportunity going to be? Right, not expecting that they had what three percent odds to to land at the you know the top of the lottery, and and it was hard to know. Like, is, is there even in the next three year window, are they going to have a chance to make a really material change to the roster? And then this happened, right? And I know everyone's like, well, this isn't the normal draft class. And th there's plenty to, to say about that. And I, um, I'm not the right person to kind of give a full perspective on that. There's a lots of draft experts out there. Go go read everything and listen <laughs> to everything Sam Bassine puts out, right? It's just a starting point. There are others too. But but for me, I mean, I, I mean, those of us who are wanting to provide some perspective to Hawks fans have had to go look at the five or six players that are kind of projected to be potentially at the top. But to me, the most interesting aspect is that I didn't know if in the next three years they'd have a real opportunity to kind of do something significant, and now they do. Right? We'll see what they do with it. But that that this is that, that makes this summer that much more important for them to navigate really well because you don't get these opportunities that often yeah and not to overstate it but because they owe their draft for the next three years after this this is it already was an important pick just to add to the pipeline because you know i i will be the one i'm sure cautioning people not to put undue expectations on any rookie in particular but with it what's number one overall pick and all that stuff but it is their it's their last traffic that they have a hold of at, at the top until 2028 i mean that's that's the re right now i know there's this 
scenario where they trade with San Antonio or whatever. But un until that happens, which is unlikely, no matter what, you, no matter what anybody thinks, that's very unlikely to happen. Where they get their own picks back, they're that they're not in control of their own draft. So that I mean, it was already going to be important, and it already was going to have this spotlight on it. But I think people that kind of realize, like, hey, this is their last potential high draft pick for four years. Even if obviously you want you look, we all know you want to be winning games and you want to pick him in the 20s. That Ideally, you want to pick him in the 20s every year. <laughs> but they haven't been there for a while. So it's like, all right, we have this one premium chance now. And um, that kind of just throw, gets thrown in the mix of everything else because as you and I have talked about and we'll talk about, they have other decisions. And I don't know if you listened to it, but I made sure to credit you on the uh, on the chat with Tyler just talking about yeah. how or organizational plan is kind of uh, the thing that I know you've been preaching for months and months and years at this point. And it feels like it's just everybody maybe – finding out like, Hey, it'd be nice to have an idea of what you wanted to do big picture. Yeah. And, and to me, I maybe just one minute on this, but in terms of who you pick, a, it really, really matters. Like what they feel Trey's commitment is to the organization and Trey for oh, the yeah. first time, the, the first time the last few months has kind of started talking about, you know, I want it to happen here, but if it's not going to happen, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing and, and picking someone to play with Trey and picking someone to potentially not play with Trey is a completely different calculation, completely oh, yeah. different right, calculation. And, you know, I know Hawks fans hope, you know, Trey sticks it out, hopes this summer is kind of an, uh, an opportunity to kind of iterate the roster to a much improved status. But does SAR make sense if you're not sure Trey's going to be with the Hawks onto even his next contract, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, Risha Shea, we got, you know, we saw, you know, the Hawks brass traveled to watch him play just a couple days ago. And, uh, you know, Matas is a guy who is kind of unknown to me. I mean, I, when I go look at the, what's available on him, I see stuff from three years ago and then two years and it's all very different. Like, so I, I, don't, I feel like I can't really develop any, even a quasi expert view on what he is right now. Um, but there's a lot of enthusiasm around him and some people are interested in kind of clinging and, you know, and stuff. But for, for me, it really does kind of come down to what are we anchoring this roster to? What is the centerpiece? And do we feel like Trey is going to be with us in the next five years, whatever number of years, so that we can kind of function with that being the foundation that we're trying to build around? Um, or, you know, is there a converse, is there hints or concern that you know Trey's not gonna necessarily kind of be committed if they can't kind of get the, this team winning a lot of games next year. And I, th I think it, Trey has said it's simple as that. I want to win, and I think win. if they can kind of develop a roster that's gonna win a lot of games, I would guess things are gonna be fine. If for some reason they can't do that, they're not using the MLE, they're not you know using all the financial resources, all that sort of stuff. Then I think next summer could be super super interesting. But that's a massive factor in which way they decide to go with the first pick. No, it's good context as well, because, you know, I referenced on the last solo show that I did as well as with Tyler that, you know, the Hawks are going to want to talk to Trey. And that's something that Shams talked about in pretty plain terms on a, on a report that he had this last week. And some of the pushback, as you might expect, is like, well, why why would why would a player make this decision? It's not about him making the decision. It's exact. It's a whole range of things. Number one, he's the franchise player until he's not. So that guy is always a part of the decision making process. I'm not, you know, there's obviously varying degrees from like actual control to input to we want to at least run it by or, or there's, you know, that's always up for debate. But what you just pointed out is almost more important. It's like, you know, there are always challenges or opportunity, however you want to frame that to building around a guy like Trey. He is limited in certain, in certain respects. And if you know, or you're very confident that he's going to be your guy moving forward, you might prioritize different things. It's just what, you know, Alex R might be a better fit next to Trey than without Trey for just to use the most practical example of a guy who everybody wants to talk about right now. It's easier, especially with the rest of this roster to look at Alex R and get excited. If you know, you have a, a plus level offensive engine at point guard that can set up everybody. You know, if you don't have Trey, or if you don't know you're going to have Trey long-term, it doesn't mean you change your pick, but it is something that would be just for information purposes not only for us, but for, for the organization. Like, I think that you really need to have a good handle on all of your roster, but especially this decision in the backcourt to inform your draft pick. And it, at the end of the day, you still take the best player. If there's a, if there's a tier gap on Landry for on Landry Fields board, you know, you take the guy that you think is the best player, but if it's close or if these guys are in the same tier, you'd be silly to ignore the context. 
And that doesn't mean like it's a small guard or it's not a small guard. I, I don't think that you would draft Rob Dillingham or Reed Shepard anyway at number one overall. But, you know, it, Risa Shea versus Saar versus Klingon versus Ha, which, whichever guy you want to say it is, intuitively, some of those guys fit better on a roster with Trey or some of those guys fit better on a roster without Trey. And that's part of the decision making process again, if it's close and if you have the information. Yeah, totally. For me, I, I have to confess. So, I, in the last, I don't know, a few weeks, I read everything I can on SAR. I've watched, I think, four of his NLB, NBL games. So, there are, I don't know, 20 people. There are many more. I've <laughs> seen 20 times more than me, right? So, go listen to them. But for me, what my own perspective, for whatever that's worth, right? And, and again, it's, it's, it's not worth as much as those experts that do this year round. For sure, but to me, the obvious choices are until it's until it's not, uh, because I just think versatility really, really matters in the current NBA landscape, and his ability to kind of do so many different things on defense and the emerging skills he's showing on offense. That that's it for me. But I mean, th- there's a lot of buzz around Matas. I mean, a lot of buzz around him right now, yeah. and it might be as simple like Washington wants to trade up one spot. And take him, and the Hawks still get you know. So it, it, I mean, it's there's a lot that that could happen there because uh, you know I don't know where all the about that noise is coming from, but there's a lot of. Ex- I mean, you just kind of listen to uh, the chatter. There's a lot of buzz about him, so that's an interesting aspect that I think Hawks fans, Hawks fans should probably start with like studying him a little bit too, reading what experts have to say about him too, because he he's going to emerge. I think as a as a guy who gets a lot of attention at the very top of the board. Today's show is sponsored by Yahoo Finance. Look straight to the point here. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation, maybe to pay off that debt that you have, or maybe your mortgage payments. Reality, it could be anything standing in your way of you and financial freedom. With with Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you're looking for in order to reset the level of financial freedom that you're actually seeking. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor, whether you're a seasoned investor or looking for that extra guidance. Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data that you need in one place. They're the number one destination for finance, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. I can securely secure my, my brokerage accounts. And for a unified view of my own wealth, including 401k and other investments, the corporate perspective is what sets apart great investors and also how fan, Yahoo Finance ensures that you have insight to look for your wealth in its entirety. They have a community of over, 100, uh, over 90 million users each month. The real strength is in helping you on your way to financial success. And for corporate financial news analysis, this is the brand behind every great investor. And that is, of course, yahoofinance.com. The number one destination in finance is yahoofinance.com. One more time, that is yahoofinance.com. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. Get on the playoff action with 100 times the money right now at Prize Picks as you and the world's best player take the game to a new level during basketball postseason. As for example, turn $10 into $1,000 with entry today at Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. It's something for everybody in your life when it comes to sports, basketball, hockey, League of Legends, and everything in between. And Prize Picks is the best way to get on the action in sports in more than 30 states across the country. That includes Georgia, as well as California, and includes Texas. Prize Picks is also offering injury insurance now, so your entries can stay in play even if one of your players happens to be injured. And it's really simple to play at Prize Picks as well. Make your picks and just met your interest in just a minute or less. It's huge for me. And one of the big reasons that I have really enjoyed playing there over the last few years is just that breezy and that easy. They have quick withdrawal, they have easy gameplay, and enormous selection of stat types and players that you can't find anywhere else. That helps Prize Picks to be the number one fantasy sports app. Download the Prize Picks app right now today and use code Locked on NBA for first time to buy a match up to $100. Again, download the app and use promo code Locked on NBA when you get there for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. I've been trying to encourage folks to cast a wide net, to use Landry's terms, <laughs> cast a wide net. Uh, and what they're watching, just because, look, I agree with you. If it's me, I'm taking Sora at this moment in mid-May. But I don't think, I think a lot of fans, not not everybody, but a lot of people like in my replies and things are like, it's just Sora. I'm like, okay, you might believe that it's Sora for you, but practically speaking, the Hawks range is much bigger than Alex Sara in the world overall. It just is. Yeah. Right now, again, if I hear differently, I'll pass that along to everybody. But for now, I think that you gotta you got to be – have a bigger worldview than the uh, center of one guy. And look, fans talk, I'm not going to impact the decision. Neither are you. Uh, it's contrary to popular belief, Glenn. People do not listen to this podcast in the organization and do what I say. They might listen to the podcast, but not, not to do what I say. <laughs> that makes any sense. Um, yeah. All right, let's pivot to player capsules. We, we, we can talk draft all day, and maybe we'll do more of that later on. I know you will be doing a lot of that with Kevin and Tyler on ATL 129 as well. 
but uh, our task ostensibly is to talk about the guys on the roster right now. And uh, we've, we've reached the point uh, on our last time we talked with Garrison Matthews. Um, he's kind of the pivot point as we talked about between the guys who didn't play very much and the guys who did, but even Garrison's kind of in the middle and everybody else from here on kind of played a lot, or at least other than Kobe Bufkin played a lot of minutes. And Sadiq Bay, again, it's not like any particular order, but Bay is really interesting. Um, he of course has a 20 CL right now, unfortunately. We we've all lamented that. Everybody likes Sadiq, and that was that was brutal for anybody, but you never want to have a guy get hurt right as free agency is arriving, and it's just a brutal circumstance for him. That goes without saying. Um, but as you know, as a player, he had kind of a weird season that we'll talk about a lot. He was really, really, really durable until now, and that ACL tear happened in mid mid March. I have a stat for you on that, by the way. Sadiq Bay, even with a 20 CL in March, finished third on the Hawks in total minutes this year behind DeJounte and Bogey, who were the two guys who were healthy all year long. I was going to look this up. Where was he in free throw rate? Because it feels like he shot a lot of free throws for a guy who's not a primary. He had a career high free throw rate this year. It was uh, actually I've been somewhere. Yeah. He took about, you know, five per a hundred, but on a, with his usage, that's actually actually really good. Um, Not a huge like volume, but like for what, for the way that he plays and the role he was in, he does take a lot of free throws. But yeah, I thought that was just, I wasn't terribly shocked because I realized he's playing a lot of minutes until he got hurt. And, you know, Trey got hurt as well, et cetera. But there were only two guys with more minutes than Sadiq. It feels like he's been gone for a long time. It's only been two months now. And a, a month of that was no Hawks. So I don't know about you. That just kind of took, caught me off guard. But anyway, as we always do here, what is your kind of broad thoughts on Sadiq's season? Um, well, by the way, just for everybody knows, we'll get into the shooting. That's That was probably the most glaring talking point that we'll talk about. But uh, what did you make of Sadiq's performance this year? Yeah, so um, a few things kind of come to mind right away. Uh, number one is, I mean, we've talked about it all year. You have, we have on our podcast. He, he just plays so hard, right? And and that really does matter. And Quinn prays that all the time. You know, he's not the, the tallest guy in the world, but he works hard to help rebound, you know. Um, when Jalen went down with the injury on the, that Kuzma play and he ended up playing more with bogey and, and at times more with Wes Matthews. And those guys have kind of limited ability to drive the ball. He took on sort of Jalen's role, attacking the paint, driving the basketball. And to me, my best guess is that's what kind of caused his shooting to get off track was just, he was asked to attack uh, with the dribble uh, penetration a lot more. And then the, the other thing that comes to mind and we can kind of get into each of these separately is, the last month before he went out, he was really starting to show some signs that he was turning a bit of a corner defensively. He was getting he was getting better uh, at switch technique. He was getting better at containing the ball. Never ever going to be a primary guy. He uses a stopper and primary on ball guy, but for him to kind of be um, a helpful defender in in the in that sense, I think is. Um, is is it's important to note that he was showing some some signs of kind of turning a bit of a corner defensively. So that those are the big things for me. I mean, Quinn called. I don't know how many times Quinn called him our rock this year. Um, I know sometimes I I heard from fans on Twitter like after he had a one four seven <laughs> you know shooting performance, and it's like it's how hard he plays. It's how it's him willing to to take on a suboptimal role. It's the teammate he is. It's the lead by example stuff that he does that really endears himself to coaches and teammates, even when he had what felt like a month and a half, maybe more than that, felt like he could only make about one three-pointer a week. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a great point. And, you know, Quinn is pretty outwardly – Quinn likes Sadiq. Uh, that's not a huge surprise. Um, coaches seem to like guys who, like like you said, play hard or willing to do kind of whatever they're asked to do. He didn't have this fantastic season, as we'll, as we'll kind of get into with the shooting and all that. But, like, he is respected. Um We'll save the contract stuff for the very end of this podcast, but there is that looming out there of like what happens with him. And this is something that people have a huge split on in the league that I talked to. It's like, you know, when can he play again? How much do the Hawks value him for the future? Because this, this next year is going to be kind of, you don't want to throw it out, but most of his value is going to be the second year, third year of a long term contract. This, this first year, he's going to miss some time. I mean, he's not going to be ready to go. And at, at minimum, he's not playing in November and October. It's, that's not happening. So, anyway, We'll put that we'll put that to the side. You mentioned his defense. I actually want to start there. Oftentimes we might start with offense, but we'll start with defense on this one just because it's interesting. His his overall numbers defensively uh, were not very good. No, no, most most of the teams, 
numbers are not very good defensively. Um, he was 17th percentile in defensive EPM. That was the worst of all the high minute guys on the Hawks roster. That doesn't mean he's the worst defender. It just, you know, it's one, that's a catch all metric. It is what it is. They were better with him off the floor on the offs defensively this year. I, I do agree with you that he improved as the season went along. Um, I feel bad. I'm not trying to say I was right, but when he first got to Atlanta, people were really, really excited about because he was making he's making all his, all his threes. That was that's what the biggest thing was. And I was like, guys, he's he can't he can't defend like he can't he can't move. He's getting killed defensively. And a lot of the a lot of this year, we first half. I don't know. I, I, there's not like a pivot point, but there was a point in like January, February. From that point forward, the numbers were actually pretty good with him on the court defensively. And that's maybe when the light came on for you and what you're talking about. Um, you know, he, <laughs> I mentioned this before, I'll just, so I don't forget to say this. The worst defensive rating of any of the two man laps the Hawks had this year was Trey DeJounte, which is not great for your overall system, but that, that, it's kind of intuitive, right? Trey DeJounte defensively, not the greatest. The second worst was DeJounte and Sadiq. And he's in a lot of those not great two man laps. It doesn't mean that those guys are individually awful, but it's just kind of, that's the picture that you paint. And there's this debate as well about whether he's better at the three versus the four. People have maybe forgotten this, except for Tyler. Tyler's still mad about this right now, that Sadiq started over Jalen the first three games of the season or whatever it was. I think it's three of the first four games of the season. Sadiq was – Jalen came off the bench. That's going to be a trivia question in a few years. Jalen Johnson came off the bench in his third season willingly for a few games. Uh, but I don't know, Glenn. Defensively, let's just stipulate that he got better during the season because you said that. I agree with you. What is he defensively? Assuming he gets back to his, his normal physicality post knee injury, how do you use him? Where, where is he not great defensively? Where does he actually give you some help? Because you know he is stout, he is physical, but the foot speed stuff. Like, what do you make of the overall picture on that before? Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's worth take all time now in the NBA and NHL. I think this will give you a shot. To bring home a big win of your own at the FanDuel Sportsbook app, because FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And right now, if you're a new customer, get 150 in terms of dollars and bonus bets guaranteed. That's 100 bucks in your pocket if you can use to bet on hoops, and baseball, hockey, and so much more. But all of your favorite baseball players, basketball players, etc., and teams as well with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. The app at FanDuel Sportsbook is so easy to use. They have everything they're looking for across the sports betting space. They have over unders, they have money lines, they have game props, they have player props, future bets. Same game parlays and much more. The app is safe. It's secure. They cover the entire range of sports as well. NBA, WNBA, NFL, college football, MLB, college baseball, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA, and much more. And now is an awesome time. Sign up with the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on. One more time, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every moment more and make every playoff shot count with the folks at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Yeah, so it's such an interesting question, and I, I feel like I gave you like could give you like a twenty minute answer, which is not not, not what we want to do. On a that, well, podcast, why, why not? Why not? We, we have we have endless time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and it kind of to me, it starts with something you mentioned there. He is really strong. I mean, he is yes. incredibly strong. So he can defend up. Uh, he can defend bigger guys than him, and and I think it helps you in two ways. One, just his strength, and the second thing is it keeps him out of space where he's not as good. Right, and so that's kind of a starting point to give you the flexibility to play him against a pretty big four. And when he, if he's playing, you know, spending some time at the four, um, and it and it starts there. But for someone who doesn't have kind of the lateral athleticism that you prefer, um, mixed with, I mean, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I, for me, a lot of his bad habits map back to playing on really bad teams in Detroit. You know, that um, were not really um, consistent at running one kind of scheme or what have you. Um, but so for a guy like him, it really does come down to when you're in a help position, being on time, being in exactly the right place, right? When we talk about Garrison Matthews, we talked about him changing his spacing when he was low man to being kind of one step from the rim to being all the way up to the dotted line, mm -hmm. right? And kind of when you're not as big, getting higher to kind of give yourself a little bit more room to kind of catch a guy who's attacking the paint. Before he gets, before he's a half step from the rim, that's that spacing really, really matters. So the attention to detail as a help defender, as a defender who's rotating, all that sort of stuff, as a, as a defender who's one pass off the ball. I mean, he needs to be pretty much perfect in technique at all of those ways for him to kind of drive as much defensive value um, as he can. And when it comes to switching, I mean, 
you know, I remember, you know, we remember, all remember the Boston series. It was just a little over a year ago now. And um, I mean, they, they can do anything when he's on the floor defensively. It was just, it was awful. And I mean, DeJon, and to me, like DeJounte might get mad. So, but DeJounte was right. Maybe worse than Sadiq in that series. So <laughs> it was it was it was pretty rough. Yeah, it, it, it was it was rough, you know. And but but for me, it's like when I I watched in the last few weeks before he went down the injury, just more proactive, preparing to execute a switch, being just a little closer to the ball handler to not let that ball handler get like a big full step on him before he kind of catches that switch. And so there, you can just tell that Quinn. And his coaching staff were kind of coaching Sadiq into a lot more nuanced execution. And he was, and it was not consistent as with anything new, like when he's trying to kind of, you know, step into a, a executing with greater level, level of detail, but he was showing uh, uh, an interest in really trying to execute in with a lot more nuance. And to me, that makes, that makes a big difference. It's impossible for me to know, like, will he ever be an average defender for the position? It depends upon how much you value a good help defender versus a guy who maybe is like your third choice to play at the point of attack regularly and those things. And it depends upon if the Hawks are going to swing towards heavy switching lineup. So it really depends on what one values. But I think what he showed me was that he's capable of being coached into um, a mindset and, and, and an effort to execute with a lot of nuance that can help incrementally drive his defensive value up higher than it's been before still probably never going to be above average um hopefully uh, you know maybe a sort of a comprehensive view with good help defense and all that maybe an average defender position one day don't know if that's realistic but uh, he was definitely showing showing some progress it's interesting because you know it's gonna say it might sound strange to say that he has limited physical tools given that he looks like the incredible hulk you know what I mean? Like Sadiq is jacked and we talked about how strong he is, yeah. but you know, laterally he's not, he's not quick compared to an NBA four. He's, he's not a great side to side athlete, nor a vertical athlete. He does not really get off the floor very well. He does, you know, there's, there's ways. And you talk about switching is one way to do that. Where like he can hold up physically against a lot of guys, but, and the execution stuff, it's not the sexy stuff. And that feels, that feels like stuff that you and I are prone to appreciate more than others might just being in the right place and making the right read and um, handing a guy off when they're supposed to hand a guy off and just, you know, being a low man and actually just doing your, doing your job is underrated in some respects, but it's also a hundred, hundred percent necessary. If you are a limited athlete, like he kind of is like the, the way to have him be an average defender is for him to be in the right place all the time. And that's not always what I would say he has been uh, to our points collectively earlier he was better at that later in the year. And I think the results bore, bore that out. And again, defense is not ever one guy ever. You need everybody to be better, but the numbers when he, when he was on the court improved. And that was notable to me. If you, it was also the eye test, like he just started to be a little bit more attentive, like you say, and um, he can't afford to not be is what I, that's the, unfortunately the margin for error for Sadiq defensively is like, if he's not dialed in, it's really bad. Like there'll be nights and look, nobody's great over 82 games, and he is. Maybe that's him playing every game. All it's hard, hard. It's a lot of minutes, but there there have been nights, and there will be nights for anybody where it's not as good. But he just can't. The the, the gap there is like you're going. For, you're, you're hoping for average, like you just said. You're hoping for him to be an average defender. Unfortunately, the downside is pretty pretty rough. And in this team context, especially, you know, we'll put the guard discussion again for a later date. Um, they've been so not good at the point of attack for multiple seasons now that you can't afford to have that guy at the fourth. Cause look, so he's not a point of attack defender. I mean, we'll just say that out loud. Like he's not, he, you might have to be in a situation, but now who's available where he's got to guard one of the primary ish forwards on the other team. You don't, you don't love that, but he's never going to be a guy flying around screens. Like that's not really what he's going to be able to do, but it, it's just like, you, he's, another, he's another guy kind of like Garrison. We talked about on that podcast. You, you kind of wish that was your worst defender. And, he, and he, he's not able to be on some of these lineups. So I don't know. I mean, I think that what you said there is good about him. There is hope, I think, for Sadiq to be a guy you don't have to worry a ton about defensively, but he does have weaknesses at, at certain matchups, even if he's executing. Um, you know, Boston is one of those matchups for a lot of for a lot of guys because they just there's nowhere to hide against Boston like uh, in that playoff series. And by the way, playoff series, no one no one gets to hide in playoff series. That that's the nature of the playoffs, the crucible, however you want to put that. Um, but that was a good reminder 
from a year ago, yes, but that's that's a good example of like what the downside can look like where you just like can't hide the guy. And it's like, can you even play this guy? It was it was that bad at times in that in that small sample size. Yeah, I think the other way to think about Sadiq, uh, you know, in his potential future with the Hawks, depending upon the contract thing we'll talk about later on. But the more you have at the point of attack, the more you help him be set up for success. Right. Yeah. The Hawks absolute like were as bad as any team in the league, maybe. At point of attack defense last year. And it's funny, you look at those numbers and the Hawks had a string. I felt like it was late November into December or part of January. It felt like they were getting up 150, you know, every other game. And so anyone who played a lot of yeah. minutes during that stretch, they're they're they have no hope for the defensive rating to be yeah, it's, 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 it's fair. And they, they were worse with him on the court, but it, again, that's why I always say, like, especially on defense, it's just so hard to yeah. On offense too, but I think on defense even even more so. The the on off stuff can be so wonky. And I look, I, I like numbers. I use them a lot on the podcast. But like, it, there's no substitute for for watching and kind of seeing what you can see. And I think yeah. that uh, he was not at fault for all of that. He was part of the problem, but not certainly the yeah. problem. And and I think and I think the best approach is to pay attention to the numbers and pay attention to the context of what you see on the floor. That putting yeah. that all together is the complete picture, the most complete picture that you can get. But for example, if, you know, if Kobe's going to develop as a guy, I think can play at the point of attack. If Veet's going to be back and give you, uh, you know, more of what he gave them down the stretch at the point of attack, that's a start. You need, you know, two more guys that are kind of in that category. But the more you have at the point of attack, the more you simplify what you ask, and the more you contain how much you ask of a guy like Sadiq. And so all of this is connected. And so the formula changes completely if they were able to address the point of attack defense with, you know, being it being 2x what it was last year at least, right? That's a starting point. And so so much stuff it does does come down to uh down to that. I mean, you know, after Sadiq went down, the Hawks closed with Bogey a lot more when Bogey was starting. And you know, you'd see the Hawks down, say down six points with two minutes to go, gotta have a stop. Bogey can't contain the ball, and he just takes a foul and puts the guy on the free throw. You know, and you would hope that Sadiq is is not is able to do a little bit better than that, just with his strength, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and and that sort of thing. Bo- Bogey would just take a foul, raise his hand, and now the Hawks are down eight with two, <laughs> you know, two minutes to go. And I, and Bogey adds a ton to what they do holistically, but closing with him on defense is super problematic, especially in the the roster construction they carried through the season last season, right? Yeah. But similar to Sadiq, you know, with Bogey. The more you have the point of attack, the more you set him up for success. And Sadiq is a different defender. He can handle bigger guys. He's stronger. He's a better rebounder uh, in, in those senses. But it's one of those things where if you don't, um, you know, have any kind of ball containment, he's going to he's gonna struggle to kind of, you know, make the baseline impact that you need from a guy like him. So it's all connected. All right, that is all for part one with myself and Glenn Willis of ATL on 29. Stay tuned for part two in your podcast player of choice. We should be there right now with the rest of this conversation about Sadiq Bey and all the ins and outs of his player performance this season. Please subscribe to this podcast anywhere you might find podcasts. Also, follow the show on Twitter slash X at Lawton Hawks. Follow me there as well at BT Roland. Five-star ratings and reviews always appreciated. Also write about the Hawks and cover the Hawks and the Braves comprehensively at patreon.com slash BT Roland. I appreciate the support as always. Follow Glenn's work. We'll see, we'll see with part two. And that's always appreciated. Thank you for being here and we'll see you all next time.